fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a haughty Ohio silver, the Lone Ranger. <laughs> Before this exciting adventure, a word from our sponsor. General Mills, makers of Cheerios, the oat cereal that's ready to eat, Betty Crocker mixes, and Wheaties, the breakfast of champions. Present by special recording, The Lone Ranger. Boy, did you ever have one of those rough days at school? Maybe you didn't get a real high mark on a test or score as many points as you wanted in a game. Well, that's the kind of a day a guy likes to get home and find his mother's baked a great big chocolate devil's food cake. Mmm, -hmm. a cake that says, I think you're swell no matter what. A perfect cake, the kind mom gets every time she uses Betty Crocker chocolate devil's food cake mix. And is it easy? All the good chocolatey fixings are right in the package. All she has to do is add water and two fresh eggs for a cake that's so rich and homemade chocolatey good, you've got to have seconds, even thirds. Make sure there's lots of Betty Crocker chocolate devil's food cake mix in the cupboard at your house for a perfect cake every time you bake. Cake after cake after cake. It's guaranteed perfect by Betty Crocker of General Mills, Minneapolis. <laughs> With his faithful Indian companion Tonto, the daring and resourceful mask rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fella. Are you Silver? Dan Reed, teenage nephew of the Lone Ranger, was spending his midterm vacation with a masked man and Tonto. They camped in the hills near the town of Wood Hill while the Lone Ranger and Tonto searched the territory for some trace of an outlaw gang led by a man named Bushy Martin. One morning, Dan was riding along a ridge trail exercising his horse Victor when he heard the distant sound of a train whistle. The tracks were discernible in the valley below, so he stopped to watch the train go by. Oh, Victor, oh boy. Soon the train came into view. As it passed in the valley, the whistle again sounded. Dan scanned the slope beyond the tracks. His eye was caught by something white fluttering on the porch of a small farmhouse, a quarter of a mile away. Victor, seems like the engineer was exchanging signals with someone on the porch of that farmhouse. We'll ride into the valley and go past the farmhouse. Come on, Victor. Later, Dan approached the farmhouse on a trail that paralleled the railroad tracks. As he gazed curiously toward the house, someone sitting on the porch waved a white cloth and called out. Come on up and talk to me. All right. Oh, Dan saw a boy sitting in a wheelchair with a blanket draped across his knees. A broad grin spread across the boy's pale, thin face as he said, Golly, I thought you were a full-grown man when I first saw you. But you aren't much older than I am, I guess. I'm 14. I'm a few years older. My name's Johnny Beckett. What's yours? Dan Reed. Will you sit down and talk to me, Dan? I'll be glad to, Johnny. <laughs> I saw you waving at the train a while ago. Uh-huh. I watch for it every day and wave this cloth. The engineer always toots the whistle when the train passes. Uh, I... I can't walk. Gosh, I'm... I'm sorry about that, Johnny. Do you live around here? No, no, I'm back from school for midterm vacation. I'm staying with friends. It was fun going to school until I had an accident three years ago. Luckily, my mother used to be a school teacher, and she's taught me a lot. She says I know even more than most boys my age. Oh, that's fine, Johnny. I'm glad you're getting an education. Yeah, but, but I'd like to go to school and be with other boys. Someday I'll be able to walk. Mom says so. She says when we get plenty of money, she'll take me to St. Louis to a doctor. Oh, that'll be fine. 
maybe someday you'll be an engineer and run a train. <laughs> nope. My dad, he died when I was little. Dad was a telegraph operator. That's what I want to be someday. Of course, I'll, I'll have to learn the code and all. Uh, I sure wish I didn't have to wait so long, though. Maybe you won't have to wait, Johnny. Tell you what. Suppose I come back to see you tomorrow. Gosh, I wish you would. Good. And I'll bring two friends with me. Don't be surprised when you see them, though. One of them wears a mask and the other is an Indian. Golly, is the mask man an outlaw? No. Uh, did you ever hear of the Lone Ranger? The Lone Ranger? Sure. My mother told me about him. He rides a big white stallion and catches outlaws and wears a black mask. He... You mean he's the friend you're going to bring to see me? Maybe, Johnny. I think he'll come with me. Anyhow, I'll see you tomorrow. Dan returned to camp, and that evening told the Lone Ranger and Tonto about Johnny Beckett. He finished by saying, Johnny seemed so brave and hopeful about everything. I felt I wanted to help him. Perhaps I can arrange it so that Pop Jackson will let Johnny visit him at the Midway Telegraph Shack. And we'll teach the boys something about telegraphy. Oh, gosh, Johnny would like that a lot. Good. We'll see him in the morning. Meantime, I'll make arrangements with Pop Jackson. The following morning, Johnny Beckett and his mother were both thrilled at meeting the Lone Ranger. And the boy joyously agreed to go with his newfound friends to Pop Jackson's telegraph shack, not far from the farmhouse. Every morning for more than a week, Johnny was taken to Pop Shack. The boy, eager to learn, quickly mastered the Morse code and soon was able to send and receive messages with fair speed. One morning in their hideout in the hills, an outlaw gang composed of six men listened as their leader, Bushy Martin, spoke. Men, the Eastern Express is due to come through today, and it usually carries plenty of cash. Well, how do you know that, Bushy? I knew an hombre who was an express clerk on that run. He told me the train coming from the East the last week of every month carried payroll cash for the Far West Army Post. The express train that's coming through today will be carrying that cash. Mm -hmm. You figure on holding up the train? Well, how do you plan to do it? I understand the railroads doubled the guard on the east-west run lately. <laughs> that won't matter. The way I plan it, it'll be easy. Yeah? Now listen, I've checked carefully the past few weeks. The express from the east has been coming through Glendale right on time. Well? A local heading east from Woodhill always gets a semaphore signal at the Midway Telegraph Shack to wait on the siding there. Go on. If that local doesn't wait at the siding, it'll meet the express head on, about two miles east of the siding. Well, how do you know that? I've been timing the run of both trains. Now, this afternoon, before the local is due to pass the Midway Shack, we'll go there, make sure the express is running on time, then knock out the telegrapher, tie him up, and cut the wires. We'll have time to reach the approximate place where the trains will meet before they collide. Yeah, well, right. good idea. In the excitement, we just grab the strong box and beat it. That's right. Slicker and I'll attend to things at the Midway Shack. The rest of you will ride to Rock Canyon, which is about where the wreck will take place. Good. Right. After lunch, the Lone Ranger and Tonto left camp to resume their search for the outlaw gang. Dan Reed, intending to visit Johnny at the telegraph shack, rode partway with them along the ridge trail. As they approached a heavily wooded area, as they pulled to a stop, a sheriff and posse rode from the woods and came toward them with ready guns. All right, we got you covered. Reach and don't go for your guns. All right, do as he says. We spotted you coming along the lower trail, so we hid in the woods till you got here. You three must be part of the gang we're hunting. Oh, oh you're mistaken, Sheriff. We're not outlaws. And the young man with us doesn't carry a gun. And I don't know about him, but that mask says you're an outlaw. It's his hard luck to be riding with you. It will take only a moment to explain. Shut up. I... I'll do the talking. We're taking you to Wood Hill, locking you up. That's right. Keep covering and watch him close, man. We'll disarm the masked man and Indian. Now listen, Sheriff. I can... Thunder, shut up or I'll plug you. Why are you not listening to Lone Ranger? Because I know it. What did you say, Indian? Let me say, why you not listen 
to Lone Ranger. Well, uh, here's a note from the United States Marshal in this territory asking my help to round up the Martin gang. Let me see that. All right. All right, Jiminy, this does prove you're the Lone Ranger. Mister, I'm sorry we mistook you for outlaws. Here's your note. Oh, thanks, Sheriff. We're searching for the Bushy Martin gang, too. We'd like to have you join us. All right. We'll ride with you a while. I'll leave now and go visit Johnny, sir. All right, Dan. You haven't far to go from here. See you at camp. Yes, sir. Adios. Adios. Come on, big sir. All right. Let's go, everybody. Get him there. Get him. Get him. Get him. Get him. We'll continue our Lone Ranger adventure in just a moment. All over the country, in every direction, how you, how you doing is the question, and here's one the half that happy people have to say. Weedin', oh, weedin', and do, 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 and okay, okay. And that's the truth. Take California champions, for instance. Now, way out west, you'll hear us talking about a quarterback we call Van Brocklin, a passing star with weedy style who throws that ball a country mile. And Duke Snyder, too, is a West Coast man, a fancy slugger, and a Wheaties fan who takes his bat and scares them all when he knocks the hide right off the ball. Now, these two champions know that there's big energy in their favorite cereal because there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Keep on eating your Wheaties and you'll be doo-doo-doo and okay. Okay. to continue. Meantime, Bushy Martin and Slicker entered the telegraph shack. Uh, howdy, strangers. Brings you here. Thought maybe you could tell us if the express is running on time. Sure is. Just got word through from Glendale. Good. We're taking over, old-timer. What's, what's the boy, Slicker? Right. <laughs> Mr. Jackson, they have guns. Hey, what's this all about? Never mind. Stand up, youngster. <laughs> I can't. Let the boy alone. His legs are useless. He can't stand or walk. In that case, we won't waste time on him. Tie the old man to his chair, Slicker. Right. Uh, All right, you. No, I won't let you. The local will be here in 20 minutes. I got to go out and lower the semaphore to stop it on the side. If I don't, there'll be a wreck. Yeah, that's right. This will quiet you. No. Cut the wires that run up the wall there, Slicker. Right. Pop's right. If the semaphore isn't lowered outside, there'll be a big wreck. The express is coming through from the east. <laughs> That's just what we want, youngster. The bigger, the better. The wires are cut, Bushy. Good. The old man will be out for some time, but we better tie him anyway. Drag the boy's chair across the shack, away from the old man. All right. <laughs> Shall I tie the kid? Ah, he's helpless. Why waste the time? There. The old man's tied, but it really wasn't necessary. Now let's get going in a hurry. We want to join the gang at Rock Canyon in time for the wreck. Come on. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Oh, no, you. You can't hear me. The semaphore. i got to try to get to it and lower it before the local gets here. Johnny, with beads of perspiration running down his forehead, tried to get from the chair. Finally, it overturned. I have to get out there. I have to. Slowly, he crawled to the door and for many precious minutes tried to reach the latch. Finally, he managed to get to his knees with great effort. I got the door open. The boy, dragging his helpless limbs behind him, crawled outside. The semaphore post to which the big lever was attached was about 20 yards away. But as Johnny looked at the rock-strewn ground over which he must drag himself, he was afraid he couldn't make it. If I could only use my legs, I have to reach that lever. I have to. Slowly and painfully, the boy moved onward, pausing to rest every few feet. Because of his long confinement to the wheelchair, the boy had very little strength. But he struggled on, in spite of the small, sharp stones that cut his hands and ripped his clothing. Finally, he reached the base of the post and lay a moment sobbing with pain and exhaustion. I, I can't hardly move. It, it took me as 
no longer come this far. I look oh, It's coming. I have to pull myself up to reach that lever. Using every bit of strength he had left, Johnny pulled himself up the post, hand over hand. Then for a moment he was upright against the post. His hands grasped the lever as his legs gave way. Though he clung to the lever, the weight of his frail body wasn't quite enough to swing it downward. I can't pull it down. I can't. Dan! Dan, quick! Johnny! Johnny, what? The lever, pull it down, quick! All right! It's stopping! It's stopping! Dan, if you hadn't come... Hey, Johnny, easy, easy. Everything's all right. Now stop crying and tell me about it. Between stifled sobs, the courageous boy told Dan about the two crooks and related all that had taken place. Meantime, the engineer saw Dan and the boy and came over to see what was the matter. Great, i throw on the switch. I'll pull in on the side. What's the trouble? Dan explained quickly, then said, Listen, mister, the sheriff and Apostia are with two friends of mine not far away. I suggest you keep tooting your train whistle. That should bring them here and they can go after the gang. Good idea. I'll do it. I'll carry you inside, Johnny. You gonna tend to pop? Let's go. <laughs> The Lone Ranger and Tonto rode with the posse through the nearby hills. They heard a sound that caused them to stop. That's a train whistle, Sheriff. But from the way it's being blown, there must be something wrong. Yeah. I suggest we head for the railroad and find out about it. That's a good idea. All right, let's go, everybody. Come on, come on. A short time later, the Lone Ranger, Tonto, and the posse arrived at the siding near the shack. Dan met them and explained what had happened. If Johnny hadn't been clinging to that semaphore lever, I wouldn't have known anything was wrong until I entered the shack. By that time, the local would have gone by. That brave young lad saved us from a big wreck. The express is due to pass here in five minutes. Yeah, Bushy Martin and his gang are at Rock Canyon. Let's go get them. Yeah, but when they see the express go by and there isn't any collision, they'll know something went wrong. In that case, they may ride this way to find out what did go wrong. Then we can pick up the trail. All right, let's get going. Easy, steady, big One, two, three. At Rock Canyon, Bushy and his men waited nearby for the trains to come along. Finally, they heard a train whistle. Hey, that came from the east, Bushy. The express is coming. Yeah, the local ought to be coming along soon, too. Yeah. A few minutes later, the express train rushed by. Uh, I was sure they'd meet about here. You must have figured it wrong, Bushy. Mashup will take place closer to the shack, so we better get going in that direction. Uh, yeah, let's go then. Oh, He's right. there. Here, come on. Here. The outlaws had ridden about a mile toward the telegraph shack. When rounding a turn, they came face to face with the Lone Ranger and the posse. Hey, Bushy, look, a posse. All right, we told you. You're up numbers. Use your guns, men. Give it to him. The outlaws fought back desperately, but they were far outnumbered by the posse. Those who were not wounded surrendered. All right, hold your fire, man. Hold it. Well, we got them all, including Bushy. We'll take them back to the jail in Woodhill. There are plenty of charges against them. I'll hold our ride back to the shack and look after Pop and Johnny, Sheriff. Well, there goes the local, safe and sound, thanks to that brave lad. Yes, Johnny Beckett showed great courage. Come on, Tonto. Adios, Sheriff. Easy. Easy. We'll see you later. Adios. Goodbye. Later, Pop and Johnny were taken to the Beckett home, where they were both given attention and put to bed. The following morning, Johnny sat in his wheelchair beside Pop's bed when his mother brought in some visitors. Look, Johnny, you have visitors. Hello, Johnny. Good morning, Pop. Morning. Gosh, the mask man and Tano and Dan and the sheriff and the train engineer. 
We all came to see a very courageous boy. That's right, Johnny. The people on the local took up a collection for you. And here it is. Two hundred dollars. Golly. Oh, that's wonderful. We'll save it, Johnny, and someday... Add Wait a minute, to... Mrs. Beckett. Hmm? I have something to say. You see, there's a reward goes to anyone giving information leading to the arrest of Bushy Martin and his gang. A thousand dollars. The reward is yours, Johnny. Mom, a thousand dollars. Yes, and the railroad superintendent sent word that they would add whatever more is needed for Johnny's operation, Mrs. Beckett. And you and the boy will have free transportation to and from St. Louis. Oh, that, that's wonderful. I, oh, Johnny, it may mean you'll be able to walk again. A boy with Johnny's courage, Mrs. Beckett, is sure to come through with flying colors. Dan, help. If he hadn't... You come... did it all, Johnny. Oh, here's a little gift to remember me by. I leave to go back to school this afternoon. Golly! A practice telegraph key. Thanks. I bought it in town this morning. We better leave now, Dan. You don't want to miss your stage. Right, sir. Adios, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. We'll be praying for you, Johnny. Goodbye. Goodbye. Someday, Johnny, you'll be a fine telegrapher like your dad was. Gosh. It's all because of Dan and his friends that I'll be able to walk again and play like other boys. I, I'll never forget them. Ever. I know how you feel, son. I've prayed a long time, and somehow I feel that it was an answer to my prayers that that the good Lord sent Dan and the Lone Ranger. Special recording Mondays through Fridays at this same time.